It's an interesting statement, actually, because... Statement? Yeah, it's a... No, it's a state, right? Like, when Buddha started enlightened, right? Since you're talking about that topic, why not? Um, he just sat there. Maybe he didn't, like, sing it loudly. He just, in his deep meditative states. As what you guys are doing now, if you go really, really deep, you're basically doing what the Buddha did under the Bodhi tree. There's no difference. Uh, there is a basis on that, there is what Buddha has taught us on that. But basically what you're doing now is what Buddha's doing. It's just the form is different. Because for us it's easier. We sing it more, we follow it, and then we let go of our egos and stuff like that. And focus on under. And when he did that, he just opened his eyes and looked at the stars. I think that story is quite common. Uh, the world, you know, and understand Buddhism to learn that. And what we need to know further than that is, what did he see when he looked at the star? What did he actually realize and what makes him do this? What makes him go out of these beautiful meditative states and walk to the you know, daily lives of everyone and tell them, hey, this is a path you can follow. And people who does not follow might tell them the stories of this problem and then he find another way to help them to get back to the path. Stuff like that is a lot of work. And why is he willing to do that, right? And that one statement that Alex just mentioned, enlightened, he realized something, and he's like, oh, oh my God, basically, oh my God. Um, everyone has that ability to be enlightened. Rather, everyone's already a Buddha. That's a very big and bold statement, because right now we see a lot of troubles in our world, we see a lot of troubles in our society, sometimes in our family, in, in ourselves, in other people. Now, how can we believe that they are wondrous, well-rounded, perfect like Buddha? And, and it's hard to believe, but that's what Buddha said. Even before he started the historical four noble truth, he was already giving this statement. It's just not directly to humans because it's, like I say, our condition did not allow us to see directly. He said it to his advanced students in Tushita Heavens, um, somewhere, Taoritin. I forgot the Sanskrit. I think, yeah, Sanskrit is Tushita Heavens. Yeah. So we also learn a bit about Sanskrit because we speak English. And I think it's very good for us to learn the Sanskrit a little bit com in, in, com uh, how it, in uh, as complement to Chinese, which is the basic source we have. We'll talk a little bit about the history of that. So, yeah. Returning back to that, he talked to his advanced students about that. And everyone, obviously, they are state of mind, they are society, the, the place they live in is basically pure. Land. They can see that. So for us, what, we, what we're trying to get out of this, what we're trying to do in this session is just, you know, we might not be able to get there immediately, but let's explore that opportunity for us. Give ourselves an opportunity to grow into that Buddha. Because remember, Buddhism is not about you follow these rules and then you follow me forever. That's not what his intention is. His intention is always, how to say, restoring you back to the precious gem that you were. You know, some, some part might be dirty, some part might be covered in dirt and stuff like that. The job of the Dharma, Buddha Dharma Sangha, is just basically wipe it off, restoring back. And how do we wipe it off? Everyone has a different dirt they accumulated over time, right? Or everyone has a different flaws they perceive over time. And everyone has that different perspective. But there's only one Buddha nature. There's only one truth. All right. There's only one, how to say, one state. But the thing is, everyone has a different perspective. So I'm going from that high philosophical understanding first, because we're all educated. And we all have a training, scientific mind as well. And I will use a bit of that as well, as Master Ching Kong did in, in his speeches. He used a lot of quantum physics and stuff like that. But let's go back to Buddha, the man himself, um, the teacher himself. So, how, raise your hand if you know, I'm in the phone. Raise your hand if you know, uh, you have a seat. If you know the, uh, um, no, I think we need to get seats. Do you have more seats? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, you eat Susanna. Okay. So, 
how, raise your hand if you think Buddha is around 3,000 years ago. Or raise your hand if you think, I mean, sorry, sorry, first. Who thinks Buddha existed 3,000 years ago? Started 3,000 years ago. Who thinks Buddha started 2,500 years ago? <laughs> There's no difference, right? Why do I say that? Because there's a lot of scholar argument about this and that. Does it matter in your path to enlightenment? No. That's right. We avoid that kind of pitfalls. Remember, Buddha does not care that, you know, the archaeology finding of that, or how many Sharira, the, the, the remnants left behind him. He only cares how much you have used his teaching to your benefit and the benefit of the people around you. That's the starting point. If we just say benefit for all sentient beings, that's it's broad. How do I get started? Right? We always get, I myself especially, get stuck easily in that big, broad idea. I love it. But when I go to my daily life, if I'm getting angry, I'm still getting angry. If I'm getting, getting greedy, I'm still getting greedy. So my life has not changed. Did I actually learn his karma? Or did I just take the big idealistic part of it, the nice, beautiful part of it, and ignore the part that I need to work on. Right? That's also another thing we, we, we are trying to do here. We make it more actionable, something you can take home, something you can grab, something you can use it straight away in your life, in your study, in your career, in your relationships. And my perspective is limited. That's why I need your help in this. It's not me teaching, it's just because I have the privilege to access in two languages and this faculty, so I will basically be a translation machine. I'm no teacher, do not call me teacher. I'm one of you, I'm a student. I'm always a student. And all, we only have one teacher, which is Buddha. Right. Chaimani Buddha, Amitabha Buddha. They're all Buddha. So, going back to the point of historic, historical perspective, right? We have Chaimani Buddha, but who was he before Chaimani Buddha? Anyone knows his uh, lay person name? Prince Siddhartha. Prince Siddhartha. What's the full name? Family name? Siddhartha the Prince. <laughs> <laughs> That's his title, like Prince William, <laughs> Prince Harry. Siddhartha. Our name is Siddhartha. <laughs> Do you, anyone knows his um, last name? Family name? Gautama. Thank you, Alex. Gotama. Mm. What is that? Gotama. So Gotama is his family name. So in India, anyone have heard of? The caste system, please raise your hand. Caste system, yeah. Would you like to explain what caste system is based on your understanding? Yeah. I know that there's a hierarchy, but the specifics I don't mm. really know. Do you know which uh, well, hierarchy Buddha's family is? In? I mean, he was royalty, basically. Mm, quite high, isn't it? Mm. So, very nice. Um, he's basically level two. Level one is Brahmi, level two is Sakya, Sakya Muni, Sakya. And level two, level four needs to rely on Wikipedia. See? Because this guy did not do nothing. Um, the caste system basically is Brahmins, and then is Kasha Triyas, which is the Buddha's clan, Vaishra, Vaishriya, and Sudras. I'll, I'll, um, I'll just bring it up briefly. Understand his context first, and you will understand when he recruit the disciple among all levels, I don't want to spoil it for you guys, but basically you understand how significant it is back then when he actually recruited people from lower ranks. It's unheard of. He's of noble blood, blue-blooded. Have you guys heard of Harry Potter? Right. So why is it Harry Potter? Because he's, they're all talking about pure bloods, undesirables. Basically that sort of discrimination, right? It's basically what actually happened in India. And even nowadays, they're still trying to work on it. It's still very hard to get rid of that mindset. However, we do not dwell in that. What we're trying to say is Buddha is born blue-blooded, very noble lineage, very powerful, very talented. He's known number two. Number one, Brahmin focus on you know, monks, teaching, priests. So in India back then, the tradition is very strongly respected towards the monastics, the lay monastics. Hence, later, if you as I go deep into it, you understand why they can survive just by walking around, asking for alms from the people. If they do it in ancient China, even in modern China, some of them can survive, but some of them can't. That's why they modify the system. 
I'm not going to, to fly into that. We're going to stick with Buddha and his time when he's still in the earth. That's it. So being a person of noble lineage, being a person of you know powerful family, his mom and his dad is also from. So where did, where, uh, anyone knows the Buddha's birthplace? Talk about the original name. Zhang. Where? Zhang. Nepal. Nepal is modern modern place. Good. Mm -hmm. What about ancient? In the jungle. In the oh, jungle. Morning, morning. <laughs> yeah, he is in the jungle. Yes. And then when he came, when he was born, he the ten first steps had lotus flowers. Yes. Thanks yeah. for spoiling my story. Oh. No, no, everyone knows. In the jungle, I'm not of course everyone funny. knows. But um, everyone knows the name. Lumbini. Lumbini Garden. Yeah. In the jungle. That's right. Mom was, <laughs> his mom's basically <laughs> carrying a, a ten month or nine month old baby and say talk, talk to the king the husband and say hey i'd like to go back to my um, home city to give birth it's like of course darling go and then he sent a thousand like i don't know the whole contingent regiment of army to escort her so she just walking walking and then suddenly she's like oh, in labor sorry guys i, <laughs> I should not do that That's, i'm a male and i appreciate that <laughs> our mothers have to go so she's doing that and then and then baby just came out right according to the history mythical part what well, we call it mythical because we can't understand it let's just put it at that modern sensibilities all right mythical part uh the baby came out from the left side it's like what all right but just leave it at that right if you take it or not take it it's up to you but baby came out from the left side this is basically what yeah so was you see a school master yeah yeah. The Chinese word. That the Yue has a lead. What is it? Is it the same or is it Jin? This is what? Yeah. yeah. She came out from there. So nothing from the 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 human not uh, anatomy we understand. Basically, that's just showing that he is not a normal person, like in a good way. He is a stage. And even before that, they have predicted this person will either be. They have only two career paths. One is the greatest teacher alive. One is the greatest ruler alive. So he's destined either to be the greatest ruler, Chakravati. In Chinese, it's called Zhuan Yun Shi Long. Have you guys heard of the Indian uh, you know, yoga teaching, Chakra? Chakra means wheels. Chakravati, the kings of the wheels. Right? And in, in uh, Indian uh, understanding is Chakravati. Vati, everyone, um, every cycle, there is a destined ruler that can over that can rule over the world with virtual and just, all right? How virtual and how just is based on the five precepts and all that. Basically what we're learning in Buddha here. And the bigger the merit you are, the bigger the realm that you rule over. That's for those who wish to be in the worldly pursuits. But going back to the main point, he has two paths and everyone's predicted. He's either being a great king or the great teacher and the teacher who attains supreme wisdom. So when he was born in Lumbini Garden, his mom was like, okay, let's go back, of course, right? Back to the Kapilavasu, which is his um, father's town, all right? And in Kapilavasu, everyone's like, congratulations. But anyone heard of a story where a sage is crying, looking at a baby? No? When they, when they congress the king? No? So, there's a sage carrying the baby and look at him. He smiled and then he cried. And he said, the king was like, why do you cry, man? Like, it, imagine you have a baby shower, every friends and family coming over. Some, one guy, like elderly, very wise person, suddenly crying. What would you feel? Crypto. Hmm? Crypto. Crypto. What, what happened, right? <laughs> like, you're the wise person. You're the one who knows a lot of things here. And suddenly you cry looking at my baby. Because the king has the same feeling, and 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 he's like the great sage is like, um, I cried because I mean I smell I smell, pardon my English I smell, uh, because a great person has been born. But I cried because I was not I would not be there when he grown into that great person. So basically, it's a it's a good thing. So I'll skip over the details, but. The most important point is who was he before he's the Buddha, right? His personality, all right? 
So everyone, uh, when we walk into Nepal, the both Gaya trees and all that, we all learn that he become Buddha. That's what he become famous for. But when he was back in his home, what kind of person is he? What kind of attitude did he have towards his servants, his family, his parents, his you know animals, small animals, right? And what kind of skill did he have? Worldly skills. Like how talented is he? Right? Have you guys heard like he had, he can shoot very well? He can do mathematics very well. Basically, he would be a great engineer if he wants. He can do um, archery, mathematics, um, riding, horse riding, everything. Everything in the world. Basically, put it in modern term, he either own a top 500 AFX company, corporate, all right, very handsome, very rich, like his family would give him like, all the bands and all the stuff. You know, you want Ferrari, go for it. Lamborghini, go for it. All right. So in our common conception, we might be thinking, yeah, Gao Fu Suan in Chinese. Uh, basically, he's handsome, he's very powerful, powerful, he's very talented. But despite all that, he always has that soft-hearted demeanor, like very, how do you say, he's a very caring person. Like based in, based, based, based in the record, he's always caring for the little animals. And there was a case where he displays his wit by having, you know, his, his cousin, Devadatta, which is a very main character later in the in his later stage as a Buddha, came over and it's opposite of Buddha. Basically what he did is he likes to kill, he likes to you know, play those hunting and stuff like that. Buddha never did hunting, even though he can shoot. Skipping over that, Devadatta one day shot a swan. And that swan, because he just wanted to shoot like a sport, and Buddha saw the swan fell on the ground, still alive. He immediately go and recovered. And then Devata was like, give me back my swan. This is my, my game. This belongs to me. And then Buddha was like, well, if you manage to kill it, it's yours. But right now I'm still alive. I'm, his, I'm the one who saved him. Right? So I will be his carrier. So he's like, no, I'm the one who shot him down, shot it down. So I have the right to the game, to claim the game. So that's, and back in India, every dispute was put in public discourse because they love to talk. They love to discuss discourse. And um, this is their society, basically, right? So instead of duel, like what we saw in the Europe, they like to duel with a gun So What they do is sit down. For those who lose, their tongue will be covered. Yeah. Why do I say something like that? Because understand the context of historical as is you will understand the importance of having a silver tongue as one of the merits in the Buddha Sutra. Right? So, of course, they're cousins, they're royalty, they won't do that. Right? So what they do is they just have the whole people gather around and argue. And Buddha was, how to say, very sharp and witted, even though he's soft and kind, but he's not a fool. He understands how to, um, how to say, uh, how to use all the expedient means to achieve the goal of compassion, to save the life. So it's like, if a swan is being killed, it's yours, because you can't save it anymore. Right? There's no point. But now the swan is still alive, it's still breathing. And then I'm, I'm helping it to recover, taking off the arrows, cleaning the wounds and stuff like that. How can it be yours? Right? And, and the swan has survived your ordeal, has survived your you know, shootings. So it has the right to life, has the right to live. He didn't just say, I uh, heard him say, you should not kill. Uh, killing is bad. Of course killing is bad. Bullying a small animal is bad. We all know that. But towards the person he's talking to, right? You don't use that method. Why? Do you guys know why? If you talk to someone who likes sport hunting, say in Colorado, USA, it's like, you should not shoot a duck. It's bad. Killing is bad. Do you think he will listen? No. He'll get angry. Yeah, he'll get angry. All right, he'll be like, get out of here, something like that. So instead of doing that, he's like, no, let's look at the actual thing that he shot. And, you know, let's talk about this one. This one's still alive. So if he's still alive, I'm, his, uh, I'm the one who saved him. It's my duty of care to kill it. And you already have your own attempt and you didn't manage to kill it. So 
You have no right to do that. Basically, that's what he said. And everyone's like, that's very reasonable, right? You shot that swan, and that swan's still alive. That means he has you no know, lives to go on. So his savior will be the one who take care of it. So many of these examples I'll bring out as we share it. Showing his, he's not showing off his wit, he's using his wit to achieve a goal, which is saving a life. And that's something we can use in our daily life. Right? It's not, it's not braggy, it's not being, how to say, um, boastful or something like that. That's not good. But think of samurai. When they have that sword, right, and shield, it, that means it means business. But they have a kick, they do not let their sword and shield at any circumstances until they have to use it, either to serve their lord or stuff like that. For us, we don't use the sword, we don't use the gun, but we use our mind a lot, our wit a lot. When the times comes, we need to unshield it. But every single daily life with your family, with your friends, with your, you know, colleagues and stuff, you don't need to do that. Only do, only use your, your gift, everyone has a gift. Only use your skill, your gift, your experience at that very moment. And then in a daily life, cultivate that sense of, how does it, tranquility and peace. Just go about your daily life, relax, understand a bit more, accumulate a bit more. So that's it for, I mean, it's 10.55. Uh, let's just leave a bit of gap for everyone to share. I'll try to finish the story before he becomes Buddha next week. And then the fun part is where you know, the, fun, the, the interesting part um, will be when he becomes Buddha or the process of becoming Buddha. Why did he want to be a Buddha? All right. So, anyone has any questions so far or anything you want to know?